Do you have an aspiration to grow a successful company? Well, there are many avenues to achieving this vision. Today, I'm having a conversation with Peter Martin, acclaimed jazz pianist, educator, and founder of Open Studio, an online jazz education platform that features lessons from some of the world's most renowned jazz artists. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Peter is also the inspiration for me starting this podcast. I hope you're inspired by my conversation with Peter. He has some great advice for all of you entrepreneurs out there. Enjoy our conversation and see show notes for more information about Peter Martin and Open Studio. Peter Martin of Open Studio, welcome to the Empowerment Zone. Oh, thank you so much, Ramon. It's so great to be here. Man, I am so happy to have you on the show. People are always asking me, how did I get my podcast started? And I always talk about the story of us being at the Lincoln Center in New York Mm. and me asking you a million questions (laughs) on how to start a podcast. And so I was like, why not feature Peter Martin on the show uh, so everybody can get to know who he is and about his work in Open Studio and your own uh, podcast. So it's great to have you here. Oh, well, it's 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 a pleasure and it's an honor. And I'm so proud of what you've done since those questionable words I gave you at Lincoln Center. I mean, you really <laughs> took it and and ran with it and um, super, you know, having done actually several podcasts now, I know how, how much of a labor of love, but how much labor it is. So the, the content I've been following you since the beginning and, and to see the quality um, and the amount of, of content and, and the folks that you're that you're touching through this medium that I love. I love podcasts uh, is, is really really exciting to see yeah so how many episodes are you up to now so with the you'll hear podcast we are at around 950 we're a little past because we were just talking yesterday we were we're already having to plan uh and have some ideas for 1000 because we want to do something you know instead of just being like okay the thousandth episode let's do this we want to do something fun for that for sure yeah, that's always fun. I uh, I started my podcast, uh, as you know, in um, 2020. And mm-hmm. last year, um, I celebrated 100 episodes. Oh, and that's so great. so I did, I did my celebration. I was the same as you. I wanted to do some something celebratory. So I did uh, the Empowerment Zone Live. And so it was my first live podcast. So that was mm-hmm. a, a fun thing to do. Oh, so I yeah. can't wait to hear what you do for 1,000. I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, well, that's, that's great. I'm sure you saw with live that brings its own in, inherent excitement always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. And it's kind of scary too, because there's no editing or anything and people get to right. see you for the, or for me for the first time, they got to see me uh, as a podcaster, but I'm yeah. up to uh, uh, about 170 episode all, almost in my second year. And now I've just begun with, with you. We're beginning our uh, season three and you're such an inspiration for me to keep going. I've heard that or, that research shows that most podcasters only get up to maybe 14 episodes. Yeah, I'm the, I mean, I'm not surprised. I'm surprised it's even that because there's, you know, they'll talk about there's, you know, 17 million or podcasts out there, or whatever. And I'm like, not operating because I think, you know, once you get into it and you see everything that's involved with doing it, like you got to love doing this. Mm-hmm. You've got to love, um, you know, if you're having guests or if you have a co-host like I do, you have to enjoy the process of it, you know, editing or paying someone to edit, getting it up there, getting your title, you know, and mainly just I think you have to love and and trust in reaching people. Um, and then it takes I found just once we got over that hump of like starting to hear back and get engagement from our listeners and them letting us know, oh, we love the pod. You know, can you do this? Can you do an episode on this or whatever? That's when it starts getting, you know, so I think a lot of people stop before they get there, basically. Mm-hmm. Well, so for some of my uh, listeners who don't know much about you, I surely want you to tell your story so people can really connect with you and learn more about who Peter Martin is. 
Oh, okay. Well, all right. So I am a jazz pianist. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a son. Uh, and um, some other things, uh, a runner. I'm, I'm, I'm big into running and some other stuff. Uh, but I think, you know, the entrepreneur and uh, jazz pianist has kind of been most of, of, of my career. And I had a little bit of a circuitous route to realizing um, the connection between them, but it's been so exciting. So I, I have a company that I started six years ago called open studio jazz. And, um, we are, it's openstudiojazz.com. We're an online music education company, but I think what I've realized and learned over these last few years, we're more about a community and sort of a meeting place for great jazz artists and for fans and for students all around the world. We have uh, students now in over 120 countries. Wow. Um, yeah. We have over 20 artists and when, you know, we have master artists that are, that, that are with us, Christian McBride, Diane Reeves, Ron Carter, um, a, a number of just the, the top jazz artists. Yeah. But not only the top jazz artists, you know, Grammys and all that kind of stuff, but really, you know, impactful teachers and, mm -hmm. and people that, that, um, you know, are really thought leaders, but are also just inspirational. I mean, you talk about somebody like Ron Carter. I mean, he's 85 mm -hmm. years old, mm -hmm. still doing his thing, still loving it. And people still want to connect with him. And, um, you know, so it's been really exciting. And and what, it, you know, I, I as a jazz pianist, I work with, uh, started out with Betty Carter when I was 20 mm -hmm. years old, That you know, the wow. legendary jazz vocalist. So that was kind of my university, my college education. <laughs> and then um, played with Wynton Marsalis and, and, Joshua Redman in the nineties and Diane Reeves. I had a, yes. I've, I've had a wonderful career with her for 20, 20 plus years and just different jazz artists touring and doing that. Some, some of my own bands, recordings of my own. Um, but I always kind of had this entrepreneurial itch as well. And so about 11 years ago, I started um, just to try to do some online lessons and it was really early on. And, and the idea was like, I was meeting, you know, young folks usually, but really could be folks of any age, but just sort of, jazz students or jazz pianists or fans i didn't know what they were i was just meeting people on the road they were like i'd love to take a lesson with you can you help me with this or whatever and sometimes i'd have time to but usually we're moving so fast as you know on the road it's like we're on to the next place and i was thinking man it would be such a great way to be able to connect and and to do some of these things and i was teaching some at the university level at that time at northwestern university in chicago so um but that was hard to kind of reach. A lot. I mean, I had like five students there, but I'd only go up like twice a month. And so I felt like I could do more. And this is when there was a lot more online video uh, was becoming more possible. It was actually still kind of early or maybe even pre YouTube. And it was like, you know, pre iPhone. So it was kind mm -hmm. of jankety, like Zoom, um, what they call it? <laughs> flip cam was the first yes. thing I recorded, but it was just to try to sort of put some of my ideas and try to help some folks and put it up online. Um, I would send these videos to my students when I couldn't get up there in Chicago to help them. And um, then who would become my partner at open studio, a good friend of mine, Dan Martin, he had the idea. Um, he said, why don't we put these on, some places online publicly. And I was like, well, what for? No one's going to look at video online. That's not going to be a thing, you know? Um, but we did, we put it on some of these jankety video sites that don't exist anymore, but we also put it on YouTube. And, and more importantly, at that time, we put them as I, I made these videos and I called them two minute jazz. And they were mm -hmm. basically me just talking about one concept for two minutes it would be like this is how you use the diminished scale it was like super nerdy stuff it would be like i mean you would just like zone out and be like come on you know but if you're a jazz pianist i think it was kind of interesting helpful things you know stuff that you know the masters and and great teachers and and folks you know like betty carter and stuff had taught me and so i was like i'm just passing on some information um but we had these videos and they were very raw i mean like the audio and video was horrible it was just you know i mean no editing or anything just one take uh, but we put them on the very first version of Apple Podcasts. Wow. They had video. They kind of started out as audio, but they were really pushing video podcasts because they just come out with like the you remember the video iPod iPod. Yes. Where it was like the little square screen, yes. you know, Um so they wanted content for that. They didn't have a lot of content. So they started this video podcast. Now, no one hardly knew what our audio podcast was at the time. They definitely didn't know video podcast, but we stuck it on there just because we're like, well, we got to put it somewhere. We'll put it anywhere. And um, it kind of like, like really quickly, those first few videos shot up and all of a sudden it was like 10,000 downloads and stuff because they featured me 
on the Apple. I they used to have on the iTunes the podcast page yes, with the old yes. software. Because uh-huh. remember, you used to have to plug it in. You couldn't download it directly. The thing you had to play. It was such a, a a hard thing. But they had no content, so I was like one of the only music instructional people. So I was put at like the top of the charts for music instruction video podcast. So I started getting like these emails and messages from people like, oh, I love two minute jazz. When, when are you going to make the next one or comments on there? And I was like, next one. That was, that was like a one time <laughs> thing, you know, but it was interesting enough to try to keep doing it. But that was kind of where I reached my first kind of fan base beyond just people that knew me as a jazz pianist just random internet connection of like wow you've got something cool i want to learn and it was free so it wasn't like i was selling i mean we you weren't allowed to charge for podcasts i mean you still can't really so it was on apple it was just sort of putting it out there and they didn't give us any analytics so i didn't really know uh until later but then i started seeing like you know you're on the chart it was ten thousand dollars i was like what how did they find it it was just i was kind of lucky and early to the game with that and then, of course, video podcasts fell off and they canceled them. So there's that. <laughs> so that's interesting how you moved from, well, it really is not from you being a musician to be, being in entrepreneurship as a musician. Can you tell us more about your growth in entrepreneurship? Yeah, so... Um... It was a little bit, I was, like I said, I was always kind of interested in it and like how businesses worked and stuff. And I would always read some things, but um, after I started doing some of uh, like the video podcast, and then I started actually a real rudimentary online lesson site, I, I definitely started thinking like, what could we create with this? Because what I saw was we could solve a problem, not just for me, but for like, we're meeting all these people that are into jazz. And it was very niche it still is it's like people that are into jazz are like super passionate about it you know it's like they follow their favorite drummer or bass player or whatever and then if you're if you're an instrumentalist or you play an instrument or sing you want to learn how to do it you might look at yourself as an amateur but you want to connect with the best and there's not always access to teachers and so what i saw with the internet was okay wait this is a way for us to connect at scale you know Mm -hmm. so that was kind of the entrepreneur it was like okay, I, there's all these people that want to take lessons with me, but I don't have time to teach them. Plus I'm in another part of the world, but like, how can we reach them with some kind of connection? And I didn't know what that was, but I did see a business opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of used myself as the test case. I'll see, I was like, well, if it'll work with me, I definitely have friends, other artists, you know, teachers that I can get to do this, but let me, let me, let me see if it'll work where people would actually pay to watch videos. So the two minute jazz at the beginning was free, short, raw like what if i did a little better quality scripted out really did some longer lessons or whatever and so i started to really think about it as an entrepreneur and also to take some of the skills i had as a jazz musician which is a lot of improvisation we do a lot of how do you work together on the bandstand you know how do you build a team and all that and i found that super useful on my entrepreneurial journey so even though i'd been 30 years at that point or 25 years as a as basically a touring jazz musician you learn a lot actually about how to start a business. I found out by taking those skills that you need to be as a jazz musician and kind of transferring them or porting them over to the world of business. And so from your beginnings to where you are now, what was, how did you grow and expand your concept as you, as you figured out what the need was, right. And then Mm -hmm. created a business strategy to feel that need. What, what were you thinking about in terms of growth and how did you uh, pursue pursue the growth of your business? Um, well, a lot of stuff I just sort of tried to figure. It was trial and error, uh, a lot of error. <laughs> so, um, but I, I tried to like really pay attention to the early. I was lucky because I had those early two minute jazz people. And then I had these kind of core group of about 100 people within about a month that were like really interested in what I was giving them, which was just like video jazz lessons recorded. It was nothing live like Skype or anything. It was just like, I would put up a lesson every week. They would pay a monthly membership. And I quickly got to about a hundred people and I, I did something really lucky. um, And which was basically just talk to them. I was just like, what do you guys want me to do next? And part of it was just because I didn't really know what to do. I mean, I knew, (laughs) I knew a lot of different concepts, but I was just like, 
well, I figure it'll work better if they're telling me, because I don't know, I know what I want and I know what I think they'd want. But um, later on, I learned it was just really the thing of like, get in touch with your people and then find out what their problem, what their pain points are and give them a solution and make it fun and attractive if you can. And so I was kind of doing that. And once I sort of realized the concepts, those like kind of content marketing concepts and started to really piece some things together, I was like, oh, okay cool. Well, I'm sort of doing that, but how can I do that even more? You know, and it was basically the whole MVP, you know, minimum viable product concept. I was sort of already doing it by the time I read, you know, lean startup. And so when I read that, I was like, Oh, okay. I'm doubling down on this. I'm like, I got this product out there, which was Peter Martin video lessons. That was the f- first name of it. Um, it was jankity and raw, but people connected with it. They were giving me feedback. I'm adjusting it every week. I'm changing up the lessons and it's growing organically word of mouth. Um, but then I'm starting to promote it in other places, continuing the video podcast, getting on YouTube where I'm giving people free instruction. So they get to know me, they get to trust me. They become aware that they have a problem that I might have a solution for. And then, you know, the flywheel just kind of starts to turn even before I realized what it was. Um, but there was a lot of like missteps in there and, you know, um, but that core part was always and continues to be the basis of what our growth is, really. I mean, and and we still kind of operate, even as we've, you know, we have 10 employees now, we've got over 20 artists, we've got um, over 3,000 members in 100, you know, 20 countries or close to between 110, 120 countries. But it's the same thing, like getting them in and showing them trust and say, look, we're going to show you what we have. We're not going to like force you to buy this or anything. We're just going to show you. And if you're interested, this is what we have become a part of our community. Um, and it's, it's, it's worked really well. And I'm, it's been a, super exciting for me to see it and to learn really as I go. Speaking of learning, you talk about some of the challenges you had and the failures you you've had, but at the same time you did experience growth. So what type of advice would you give entrepreneurs who have an idea that they want to pursue and just, uh, want to learn from your own experience? Mm. Yeah. So I think it's really important to validate your idea early. So, um, and by that, I mean, validate it with real customers, you know, not just with your mom and your, your friends or whatever, your mom's always going to buy your thing. And of course you have to go to your friends first. Like that's your network at first, uh, you know, but I mean, that make, make sure that you have something that's at least good. It doesn't have to be great. You can work on that later, but at least is good. And that hopefully you're passionate about doing it so that when you do get to the dark days, you're going to still want to keep doing it, you know? So, um, but that's kind of a bonus. I mean, I think it's possible to sell anything that's useful, even if you're not passionate about it. People are like, oh, you're succeeding because you're passionate about jazz. I'm like, no, that's just because I know it. And I, I kind of am the product, but you can always get somebody else to be the product and you can just kind of run things. But I would say, make sure that you validate your idea early because then Once you get it validated, you know, it's just a matter of like sticking with it, executing, like really assembling the right team, really making smart decisions. And then when you do make a misstep, correcting it and then just sticking with it. What's hard and what I've seen, I mean, luckily we haven't experienced this on an overall level, but we have like on smaller levels with certain products, certain niches that we try to get into is if you don't have good like. And by valid, and I mean really like test product market fit. Make sure you're making something that the world wants. It doesn't mean a billion people have to want it. It doesn't mean you have to have, you know, a billion iPhones out there. Of course, that's great. But I mean, it can be a hundred people. It can be seven people if it's expensive enough, you know. Right, right, uh, right. You know, um, and it can be anywhere in between. It can be, you know, I never thought we'd have, you know, over 3,000 members that would pay us each month to be part of our community and watch our video. Like, I just didn't think that was possible. And I'm hoping in five years that we'll have 30,000 and I'll be like, I don't think, but I mean, there's all different levels to succeed. But if you don't early on, make sure that you have product market fit, it can be very frustrating because you might be passionate about what you have, but you forgot to test it with real people. You might've even got some investments. So like you start to assemble team, you've got a company, you've got everything except an actual operating business. Like you got a business card, you've got, you know, money in the bank and all these kind of, and I've seen this happen before. And then you're like, okay, we've got everything perfect. Now we're going to release to the world and then nobody buys it. It's like, you're better off knowing that at the beginning. Um, And so that's kind of, I think my, the best advice um, that I could give anybody. And that really, I think covers 
a broad spectrum of industries and stuff. And it doesn't mean that you have to be making money. I mean, it took us, we weren't profitable for almost four years, you know? Um, and that's, that's hard when you're like, and we were making revenue and we were growing, but we were not making any profit, you know? And there was times when my, my partner, uh, and me had to like on Thursday night be like, all right, um, how much do we need, both need to, um, go withdraw from our personal accounts to put in. So we cover payroll tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's, it's like either that or we lay off somebody, you know? So like that stuff is real, but. I never lost sight of like, I know we've got something. We might not be doing everything right. We might not have grown. We might need to redo things, but it's very hard when you don't have a product that the world wants. Mm -hmm. I knew we had that, um, it, but that doesn't mean you can't make other mistakes. But if you do everything perfect and have a, a product that's either useless or I mean, by useless, I mean, the world doesn't want it. Um, there's almost nothing you can do, I, I think, to succeed. Mm-hmm. That's a great point that if you don't, you might have all the business acumen and not have a great product or service. That doesn't, that doesn't guarantee <laughs> your success, really. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, we can see example of this at all different levels. I mean, huge mm -hmm. companies, you know, I mean, normally really large, you know, VC level funded companies don't right. get to that point because mm -hmm. big investors don't want to put money in. I mean, like they want to see proof of concept at least. Mm -hmm. They want to see validation and there's a lot more awareness. But at the at the more entry point when you're just starting out, the exciting thing is when you're just starting out, it's the easiest time to validate. So that's the that's the good thing before things get like we we struggle now as the team's gotten bigger and as we've had more things is to really figure out the you know at a granular level level what our people want because we start to get a lot of like oh we love you open studio and we're like wait what part of it that you love you love my lessons you love Ron Car like because people say they love it but that doesn't mean they're going to keep buying or it's going to mm -hmm. keep providing value for them so it gets a little more complicated as as you become more mature company but at the beginning it's just like what are you selling and who's going to buy it <laughs> you know that's it that's it so yeah. can you talk a little you you mentioned your team can you talk a little bit uh in in being an entrepreneur, what was your process of team development? Um, it this was it was a little random to be honest. You know, I, that's not an area that I had a great strategy on. But my partner Dan and then Adam Manis, who's uh, my creative director, who I brought in very early, um, had some really good ideas with this. So we've done a lot of that sort of by committee, and I've relied on them a lot. Um, but I've I've always been very much. Um, you know, of the mindset that you hire before it starts to hurt. So um, that's why, but then it starts to hurt on, on Fridays, payroll day sometimes, <laughs> because it's like you bring in somebody good, they're not, and you start paying them a salary of whatever it is. They're not, even the best person is not going to provide that money back to you and revenue immediately. It's going to take time. And it's the company's responsibility to, to have a framework where they can work and provide value and it all works together. So it's a tricky thing. I mean, but I've hired some really good people, so I'm I'm excited about that. Um, but you know, I've I've hired, I've made some bad hires, um, and I've had to fire I think two people, uh, which isn't bad. You know, we're six years in, but I look at those failures as my failures in hiring. Actually, um, I didn't. I didn't. There was nothing wrong with them. They just they just they weren't product market fit. Like how we talk about getting a product in the market. Like they weren't the right job with the right person. So I learned a lot from those situations. Um, but my concept on team bill is very much like if somebody's not in the right position, cut them off early. It hurts. Mm -hmm. It pains me. I hate firing people and it hurts them, but it's better than waiting or saying they're going to change or we're going to change mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's better to, for them to get into another, you know, situation. And I think the humane thing is to, you know, recommend, which I did recommend and use your network to help them find another job if they need it. But that's a big part of my concept. Um, and also with team building, building has been identifying those key people that can really, drive the company forwards and like preempt preemptively re rewarding them based upon what they what makes them tick mm -hmm. so we always assume that like you know give them raises that's going to keep them around and of course we all want to make more money but i found with employees like that's not the only thing that makes any of us tick that's, it. It, that's true you know mm -hmm. um and we don't always know what actually makes i mean like i think most people if you ask them like what will keep you working here what would keep you not leaving a lot of them they would be like you know, salary or benefits or whatever, but sometimes they don't even know. So it's like, you got to look for clues and really get to know them and be like, what makes them tick? Like what makes them feel valued? What really, what makes them excited to come to work every day? Like, 
And, and that's hard. Like that's, I've struggled with that with some of my employees. So I hired somebody basically to help me do that. You know, cause I'm like, I don't do that great. Always. I do with some people, but not others. So I, I think that's very important because it is so exp expensive to hire somebody to right. onboard them mm -hmm. and then to fire them. Like, I, so it's like, I never want to do that, but I mean, it's going to happen. And then for people to quit, you know, I've lost not many, but I lost one really key employee. I'm working hard to get her back to right now. But um, I mean, like that's that's another thing. Those things can derail you, especially a small team like ours. So what did I'm, I'm very curious. What did you find that really motivated people beyond a uh, raise in salary? What were what are some of the other motivations that would keep people there that you could uh, incentivize them to stay? Mm -hmm. So uh, for a couple of my folks, um, a big thing has been, you know, autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, freedom, both in terms of how they work, like, um, you know, hours working from mm -hmm. home, even like before the pandemic, of course, that changed it for everybody. Um, and also just freedom to be able to really not only be heard with their ideas if they are a leader or have, you know, big ideas and don't want to just punch a clock. Um, but to be able to like give them the resources to make that stuff happen, you that's know, mm -hmm. yeah, that's been, I, I think that that's what keeps people engaged, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then money for sure. Like keeping the salaries like competitive and, and what I, what we do is like very much like we almost always do pre, we don't do like regularly scheduled raises, but I do what I call like preemptive ones. Like before somebody comes in to ask for it, like I want to already be there offering them something. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we started like a 401k, we have health benefits that are kind of, um, you know, if not at kind of industry standard for a company like ours, a little bit above. So I think I want people to feel like this is a great pay place to work at. Of course, I can't pay everybody what I really want to pay them. You know, I want everyone to make $10 million, but um, I can pay it. You know, I can get it to that place where they, they're not wanting to go look for something else. And, and it's a challenge right now because, you know, if, if inflation's 9% or 10, you know, everybody's salary, you, you, you didn't do anything. And it's like, everyone's been cut off and, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, it's a tough time. We can't really raise our prices right now because everybody's super price sensitive. So it's something I'm, I'm definitely always thinking about and waking up in the middle of the night still. <laughs> and finally, as an entrepreneur, what, um, what advice do you have or uh, in terms of, increasing capital did you have mm. funders uh did, what, how did you grow your business in terms of getting financial support yes yeah, so we had um a seed round of investment um right at the very beginning i mean we were already kind of operating but like when we organized as open studio um the and like the corporate entity and really started and made our first hire we at the same time did a uh, what's called a seed round of investment which is basically just like the first like very initial sometimes it's even called like friends and family right. it's like you know it was vc it was a vc um a venture capital firm organized it for us but it wasn't like at you know um level a or b or whatever it's like this is just to get started and we looking back on it now, like that was super helpful for us. I mean, we're basically a bootstrap company, mm -hmm. uh, even though we did have that initial round. A lot of times people still consider a company bootstrap, even if they have a little bit of investment. So it was relatively small, but it was, it, it enabled us to make our first hire of a video editor, mm -hmm. uh, enabled us to get our first office space. Um, Dan, my partner and I, we both, um, you know, kicked into that seed round as well, but we didn't have really have anything. I mean, we had a little bit, but you know, so that was really the bootstrap part. Um, but what was great about that initial group of investors, and these were basically just like really smart, like business people and music lovers that I knew in St. Louis where, where we're located, um, that I approached and said, um, you know, well, I select fund is, is the VC firm that organized for us, but like, they helped me so much and like how to put this together. Like, so I had to do a pitch and like a lot of it was just super helpful. It wasn't, it didn't turn out to be the money that was the best part about it, even though that was helpful. It was for me to like actually have to think, think like a CEO, think like a founder, get in front of people when I didn't know what the hell I was doing and say like, by year three, we anticipate revenues to be at 800,000 by year. I mean, it was kind of all BS. Cause I was like, I have no idea, but I, I mean, it was like, I hope that this is going to happen, but I had to say it like, this is what we're going to do. And that was a great exercise for me to do. Um, and to a point it worked. I mean, a lot of people are like, sorry, you know, no, I'm not interested, but we got enough. And the contacts that we got, especially uh, two people in particular of our initial investors 
they became like kind of unofficial advisors to me and to the company. Um, and one gentleman who I want to call by name, cause he's no longer with us, but uh, Mr. Tom Townsend, who was a dear friend and was kind of our biggest initial investor. And he's like a genius um, advertiser and marketer and had a, he had a big advertising firm that was bought out by a Madison Avenue company years ago, but he was a huge music lover and he was a real lover of like my playing and fan and whatever, but also we just connected on music. But I mean, like he's this, this logo that you see here, he arranged for that with one of his people that used to work for him and that, mm. that we could have never afforded to get that at that time. And, and just little things he helped with, like, like we were originally called open studio network and he's like, we should get rid of the network, just be open studio. He's like, network makes it sound like a computer company mm -hmm. and people are coming to learn music. And so just little things like that, that were pivotal. So the personal connection, the the IP that we got from those initial, that original group of investors was the biggest. Um, and I mean, I'm super proud because uh, a little over a year, uh, what was it? Yeah. About a year ago, uh, we finished paying off all of our initial investors. So we're like, totally in control of the company and um, all investors have been paid off. They're still involved. And, you know, we may end up doing another round later, but I mean, it was, a, it really worked well for us, the kind of bootstrap seed round thing, but it wasn't, it didn't do a lot for our growth. Actually. It was more of like establishing at the beginning. Yeah. And, and I definitely wrestle with now, like, should we do another round? Cause we're kind of in a better position. Cause now when I get up to do the pitch, I can, instead of saying, I hope we'll do this. I was like, mm -hmm. look, we have a track record. This is mm -hmm. what this may not be for you, mm -hmm. but we've done this and we know we can get here because we've gotten to here. Mm -hmm. um, so although we don't have huge capital needs right now, and so it, we don't have a, like an immediate need to keep the lights on, there's definitely bigger pic picture growth ideas that we have that would probably require some kind of a raise. Mm -hmm. So do you have any uh, final advice for uh, entrepreneurs? Hmm. Well, I would just reiterate the, you know, make something that somebody loves and don't worry about like getting too many people. I mean, I remember hearing, I don't, I'm, I, I don't, I can't remember who I heard this on a podcast or read one of my business books, but I remember people saying like, especially in the kind of like business that we do where you're kind of connecting with people, you're not just, we're not just trying to sell them like a widget and then they go away and then we have to mm -hmm. find a new person. We're trying to get people in that we can sell things to every month. That they want to keep, mm -hmm. stay our customer, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I remember them saying, it's just like, get a hundred real customers. Like that's when you know you have a business. Like don't worry about 10,000 customers or a million customers or a billion or anything. And don't even worry about the money. Not not at the beginning. It's like get a hundred people that are passionate about you if you're the product or your or your actual widget. Whatever it is that you do, a hundred people that are that are really passionate about that, your early adopters. Once you hit that you know, never forget about them, take care of them because that's going to be your word of mouth. That's going to be like your validation of the product. That's going to be do all your, your market research and everything. And that's going to show to you that like, wow, I've got something that's going to get, make you get up in the morning and be like, I want to serve those people. And I think a lot of times people, when, you know, when they have something, a cool idea or a cool product, they, they're starting to, you know, they get dollar signs in their eyes and they're like, I think we could sell you know, 7 million of this by this. And you, you may do that. That's great. But it's like, think about those first hundred and first 10 people, you know, I remember I got 22 people the very first weekend when we started the first lessons, this is before open studio it was just Peter Martin lessons. I had an email list. That That's another piece of advice. I'll get, get an email list and like, take care of that list. Cause that's your connection. People are always saying emails dead. That's no, that's not true. Um, that's the way to get in touch with people. I mean, Facebook, TikTok, all this, that's going to come and go, but people, at least for now, are going to be on email and that's the way to talk to them. You know, they're not going to give you their phone number anymore. People are scared to do that, but they will give you. But I remember I had like, I don't know, a couple, it was weird. Like that initial video podcast with Apple, they, when people subscribed, they would give us a list of the emails for some reason. It was, they don't do that anymore for sure. But at that time I had like, I, it wasn't thousands, but it was definitely a few hundred. Maybe it was thousands, but I had an email list. I didn't know what that was or what to do with it, but I had a list. So when I developed the first lesson and said, okay, I'm going to start a membership subscription site and just test this, I sent it out to the list. And the very first week we sent it out on a Friday, 22 people signed up by Sunday. And mm. That doesn't include my mom, I don't think. So <laughs> it was 22 real people. And this was like $39 a month. You get one lesson every week. But I only had four lessons to start. So it was very rudimentary. But I was shocked. I was like, wow, because I didn't know if anyone would do it, you know. Um, and so that's when I kind of knew I had something. So, I mean, even before you get to 100, it's like cherish those early customers, talk to them because they will answer what you need to do next. 
and uh, get to that hundred and then just set your next milestone. Once you have product market fit and, you know, get a great team around you as, as quickly as you can and have fun with it. So Peter, uh, I am a big advocate for higher education, and I'm curious to know uh, what school or schools did you attend uh, for college? What was your major and degree? And what strategy would you give students to ensure that they're successful in college? Well, I think, um, okay, first of all, I went to the Juilliard School of Music in New York, which is a music conservatory, and um, I didn't get a degree. Um, I actually left after three semesters to I got an opportunity to play with Betty Carter, um, who was a legendary jazz vocalist. And I encourage your, your listeners, if they haven't heard, if you love music, um, check her out on YouTube or Spotify, whatever. She's not with us anymore, but she's truly one of the legends. And um, that kind of became my college conservatory education, as well as working with a number of other musicians. So it, at that time, it was kind of... Um, like Juilliard and Berkeley and these these conservatories, it was sort of common if you got a professional opportunity to you know be able to bounce out. And I was I always in my mind I was like oh I'm going to go back and it just never kind of quite happened. Um, which I don't necessarily encourage. And like certainly with my kids, they've all like either graduated college or on the I'm only on one more that's still in college. And well, my daughter's in grad school. Like we we're very much like a degree getting family, except for me. Uh, but I think in certain circumstances, if you commit yourself, like I really look at myself as a lifelong learner. I never was just like, well, I have to wait to go back to college to learn, you know, and and the conservatory, these specialized schools like Juilliard, they're so limited, which is a great thing about them, but it's only music. And there was so many other things I wanted to learn. So I've always been reading and, 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 and like, I'm more the type of person that will go and audit a class just because I want to learn about that. And so my main advice that I've given my kids in terms of going to, you know, going to college and, you know, deciding if they're going to get another degree is like really to follow their passions mm -hmm. Um, which everybody says that, of course, but also to try to find that area where your passion, like the Venn diagram between your passion and your talent and skill level as best you can ascertain it. Why? Because that can be really fun because it's not going to still be easy, but at least you're not swimming upstream on the talent. I mean, I, I love basketball. I've been playing all my life, but I'm five foot six and a little bit slow and 51 years old. So, I mean, if I decide to like really pursue that as a professional thing, it's going to be hard. Recreational, no problem. Um, but I think that those kind of things um, can be good as opposed to the thing of like, you know, go and major in something that that is going to be a job for because that stuff changes. First of all, it's like, well, they're going to need nurses. So go to nursing school. That's great. And that's your serving the world, which is great, but you better make sure that you're passionate about helping people in the medical field, because you're not going to be very successful nurse. And you're probably not going to get through nursing school if you don't enjoy it on some level. So I'm not a big believer in just following where the jobs are. I think that if you go to study something and put yourself in a college situation and get the degree and then go on to the next degree, if that's what you want to do. And it's in something that you do want to, serve even if it's an area like don't get an english degree because you can't do anything with that well there's a lot of people that are that are you know you can write i mean that's up to you you know to do because they would say the same thing about music if i had listened to them they're like don't go into music there's no jobs there's mm -hmm. no stability mm -hmm. and that, all that and i've you know been around the world and met the most amazing people because of music and i love doing it and have succeeded at it so i i don't i i, I think that the college experience should be tailored not only to that experience of that age and growing up, but also the educational side of really getting something out of it that's going to value what you want to do with your life and, and for you to help other people. Great advice. Follow your passion and make sure is when you uh, attend college that you pursue a profession that is an inter that intersects with not only your passion, but your talent and skill. Thank yeah. you so much, Peter Martin. It's great having you on the Empowerment Zone. Oh, great. Great to be here, Ramona. Congratulations for uh, everything that you've done. And I wrote it down 170 plus episodes. I look forward to coming back. Hopefully it won't be too far, but you'll be well on your way. Um, and uh, thank you so much to, to, to you and your community. Thank you. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry on Gully, theme song. NADWorks, digital support. And, of course, our featured guest, 